So you wanna be a real estate investor, but where do you start? How do you know what information and sources to trust? That's where I come in. I'm Johnny Catani, and this is the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. Hey guys, real quick, before we start, go to investwithkatani.com and download my free ebook, Is Commercial Real Estate Recession Proof? Now to today's show. What's up, guys? And welcome to another episode of the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Catani. Today, I'm joined by Justin Frazier. Justin is an apartment syndicator, asset manager, and real estate investor responsible for managing multiple apartments across the country. Justin has been a real estate investor since 2014 when he bought a single family home as a rental property. For years, Justin flipped houses and owned single family rentals until May of 2018 when he formed 88 Real Estate Capital and closed on his first apartment syndication, raising over $600,000 for the deal. By September 2018, Justin exited his corporate job as a project manager and jumped full time into real estate investing. Justin is a general partner in 12 apartment complexes holding over 1,700 units. Justin built an asset management business responsible for running the business of these apartment complexes. He's also the host of True True Multifamily, a podcast about the business of apartment investing, showcasing the real work that happens after a deal closes. His goal is to share insights, tips, tricks, and best practices through storytelling by real asset managers and owners. Justin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to have you on. And uh, like we were talking offline, definitely looking forward to getting into the uh, asset management side of things. I feel like it's uh, it's one aspect that's not really discussed that much, you know? I agree. <laughs> is it is it because it's not that sexy or what? what's the deal? I mean, I, I think so, but I find it sexy. I mean, look, everyone's got their own preferences, right? But look, you... Uh, how much time do you spend finding a deal, raising the money? Like all that is super sexy. And that's what everyone talks about, like getting to that deal. We close the deal, we pop the champagne and we ride off into the sunset, right? No, that's when the work begins. You purchase a job, you purchase a business that you have to now run. And so that's that's my mission is to spread the word about, you know, the business planning in the in the upfront process, but then now the execution and how do we spend dollars in the right place? How do we make sure our multi-million dollar business that we just purchased is actually doing what we said it was going to do? Gosh, it's so true, right? And nobody really talks about that yet. That's really when the work starts. That's right. That's right. Awesome. Well, so before we jump into that, just kind of give us, you know, we kind of mentioned here uh, in the intro you know, you got started, kind of talk about your, your intro to real estate investing and, and what led you to, to multifamily. Yeah, I was, um, I was like most people, I think, you know, found bigger pockets um, and just kind of fell in love with the idea of a rental property. Thought that was pretty cool. Saved up all my money, bought a single family house, um, you know, used a regular loan from Bank of America and put 20, 25% down and basically every penny I had extra and was like, this will be great. <laughs> and uh, I self-managed and I, you know, I went through it. I went through the, the, the check is in the mail stories from the, from the tenants and, and all, all that kind of stuff, but learned how to run a property, figured out like, Hey, cash flow is pretty cool. And um, figured out then how to get creative because I, as I said, I was out of money. So I brought in partners and started learning how to do seller finance and built a small portfolio in New Jersey um, flipped a house with none of my own money. And so just kind of tried different things, tried to see what worked and um, was kind of running into some some deal flow challenges. And really the deals I was buying, you know, at the end of the day, they were cash flowing like 200 bucks a month. And I was kind of doing the math, like, all right, 200 bucks a month. How many of these things do I need to like actually maybe leave my job or consider this full time? And the answer was like, way too many, <laughs> you know, way, way too many $200 cash flow houses. And and the too many problems and issues with that. So um, I was running a meetup and a, a friend of mine had come and spoken about a 49 unit deal that, that he had just done and really broke down the syndication process and explained like, you know, he didn't have to put up all the money and he didn't have to bring all the experience, but there's all these other people on the team. And I was like, wow, that, that's pretty cool. Cause I, by during the day was a project manager. I manage software design and development projects. So I've always had a knack for organizing people, get stuff done, budgeting, planning. And so um, I was like, this kind of fits my skill set. And so 
I went and um, my new mission was then to learn everything I could about syndication, multifamily, and just sort of had a pivot point where I decided I was going to go try to buy a 50 unit. Um, and then I actually brought my, my, my friend on, um, his name is Matt Faircloth. Um, and he, uh, he had a lot more experience than I did, but, uh, he was, he provided like the credibility I needed. Right. Cause here I was with my few units trying to go buy a $3 million, $4 million property and, uh, the brokers, the lenders, everyone's like, well, who are you? You know? And so, um, uh, brought him on as a partner. We close a 40 unit deal in Virginia. And, um, you know, as I said, in the bio there, I raised um, $660,000 for that. So I found the deal, I raised the money, I put the whole thing together, um, fronted the, the attorney fees and all that. Um, and at the end, I did it, it was great. Uh, but then three months later, um, I know my bio says I exited, but um, they really exited me. They, they cut our whole team at, at the company. And so um, thankfully, when I got laid off, my wife was like, hey, you like real estate. So maybe go try real estate for a little bit. Um, so I went back to Matt who had, uh, who was continuing to buy properties and um, needed, needed some help. So Matt and I partnered up and he brought me in and in a asset manager role. And very quickly we realized like, this is a great partnership. Matt is more the visionary, like capital raiser brand, you know, YouTube following with over 30,000 followers. And I'm like the implementer, the executor. And so together we had a very good partnership where he could attract capital, find deals, I could actually run them. And so that's sort of how it, how it was born. Um, I quickly came on to 198 unit property. And then in 2019, we bought three more apartment complexes together. And, and since then we've just been, been buying and selling and, and accumulating as many properties as we can. I love it. That's awesome. What, what a great story. And it's so great. I love hearing when partnerships are formed like that because so often you hear, um, you know, and you may have experience with this where you had to have a bad partner first, mm -hmm. you know, to, to find a good partner. So yeah, it's awesome when, yeah, when you hear someone. Uh, so I guess uh, he, he threw you right into the asset management role. Sounds like you fully embraced it. You were a project manager. So that I guess makes yeah. total sense as to why he, he would see that as a fit. So let's kind of jump into that. Like we, like we were talking about in the beginning, it's Everyone talks about, you know, finding the deal and raising the capital. And then nobody really talks about what happens after that. So yeah, give us like a high level overview of what asset management entails. And then we'll kind of dive into the weeds. Yeah. I mean, just, just to back up a second, you know, Matt, after I got laid off, Matt was having some problems at, at um, this new property he had acquired 198 unit. And I didn't know, like, it wasn't like we sat down and said, okay, Justin, you're going to be our asset manager and here's what we're going to pay you and this and that. It was like, it, it was much more organic. It was, I was hanging around Matt's office. He was talking about a problem that he was having. And, I, and he was like complaining about, yeah, but it's, you know, it's a day to drive down there to North Carolina, a day to drive back. I was like, I'll drive you. I got nothing else going on. Let me drive you. Let's talk on the way. We'll see where I can add value. By the time we get there, we've had enough conversation to know, you know, there's a contractor with a shoebox full of receipts that needs to be sorted out. And there's all these like little detail tasks. And I was like, let me take these off your plate. I'm going to go, I will sit with the contractor. We'll figure out these receipts and the invoice and everything else. And so from there, we like, that's where we kind of realized like, oh, there is a need for someone to, to do the more detailed stuff. And so it, it sort of organically came. And now we're like, oh, now we recognize that as asset management. But in the beginning, it was more like, yeah, Justin's, you know, the guy that, that helps us with, with the details. But what asset management really is, um, think of a multifamily property, you're buying a multifamily property, you're buying a business. And in many cases, what we do is multi, many million dollar businesses, right? And so you know, 100 plus unit properties, um, you need a business plan, right? And a lot of people know that they put the underwriting together, this is our plan, we're going to renovate, we're going to put, you know, new cabinets in, and we're going to raise rents. And that's our business plan. And that's great. And that is a big piece of it. But there's so much so many more details that most people will say, well, that's what the property manager is for, right? And asset management and property management are not the same thing. The property manager is responsible for the day-to-day -day implementation, the signing of the leases, the showing of the units, the reporting of the income and the expenses and the dollars in and out of the property, right? They are there on site handling that day-to-day. -day. The asset manager is one step above. The asset manager sets the strategy. The asset manager makes sure that the management company is implementing their vision, 
right? We sold, we raised all these millions of dollars to go buy this property. We told our investors that we were going to raise rents by doing this and putting in new flooring and cabinets and XYZ. Someone needs to make sure we're actually doing that, right? So I'm on the general partnership team. My job is to make sure that we are running our business plan. Um, also, staying in touch with the market and understanding if we need to pivot, right? So maybe we've been seeing lately a lot of high rent raises. So maybe we don't have to do that next level of renovation to get the same rents that we were projecting, right? So maybe we can save a little money on construction or maybe there's a new, you know, bigger problem issue that maybe we need to reallocate some funds from our construction budget to this structural thing that's happening. So the asset manager is responsible for keeping the finger on the pulse of everything that's happening within that property to make sure that we get to the desired end result, which is to perform for our investors and for us. Okay. Awesome. So you're, it's not just managing the property manager. It's really no. implementing that business plan and overseeing. And like you said, keeping that pulse on the market, being able to pivot and navigate. And so obviously this kind of also speaks to why property management is so important because you're working very closely with them. They're really your, I guess, boots on the ground, obviously at hundred plus units, you probably have someone on site. So you're really working very closely with them and making sure that everything's going according to plan. And then are you typically dealing with the contractors or are you letting them do that? And then you're just kind of, they're the middleman between um, you know, it, that. it ebbs and flows depending on the stage. So if it's a new property and a new management company for us, I'll probably be more heavily involved in setting the expectations up front. And, and usually at, no matter what, we always set clear expectations up front. Um, we just closed last week a, a new portfolio and both, portf both um, properties, sorry, it's five property portfolio in two towns. One is in Kentucky, one is in uh, North Carolina. And wow. in both of those markets, we have existing relationships with managers that we already use. So those managers already know what I'm expecting, right? Those management companies. So um, we're using a lot of the same contractors, a lot of the same vendors. So I go to these properties after we close, I set very clear expectations. This is what we're expecting. Here's the business plan. Here's the, the, what, the scope for the unit renovations, all that, right? Here's what I'm expecting to get in rents. Here's the utility build back strategy, what, whatever we're doing. Um, and then I let them go. Um, and so in that case, I have a very strong relationship with these guys. So I know what they're going to do. They know what I'm expecting. If it's a new management company um, or a new market or something, yeah, I want, I'm going to be much more heavily involved in the beginning as we're vetting contractors. Um, but you, you are hiring a good management company for a reason. So you, you don't, as an asset manager, want to step on the toes. You don't want to necessarily have to you know, you're not interviewing every contractor and, and depends on the project too. Like my labor guys, the guys that come in and turn my units for, I don't know, 800 bucks or my painters. I, I don't really get involved. I'll say hi to them when I'm on the property and see them, but I'm not like vetting that level. Um, but if I'm going to spend a hundred thousand dollars on an engineer and structural project, then yeah, I'm betting. I get much more involved in vetting that level of contractor. So now I've got a few that I trust and I know, but even that I'm still there. I'm still working with them. I just toured my property last week in, in Winston-Salem with my contractor. Like, hey, I know we've had three conversations about this before we closed. Now we've closed. So here's exactly what I want again. I'm going to tell you again and again so that there's no doubt because we're dealing with projects that are 50, 60, 70, $80,000. And so we need to make sure we get it right. And I don't want any mistakes. So you have to find that balance. Um, but certainly, you know, making sure that you're leaving enough for your property managers to do because otherwise you'll be too bogged down. Absolutely. That makes perfect sense. So I guess, so for you then, did your kind of experience in terms of recognizing what needs to be fixed and how much it should cost just kind of come through, you know, just doing it? Or do you have a bit of a construction background or where did that come from? I had no construction background prior to getting into real estate. You know, I'd done a little bit on my, my single family houses, but uh, I'm not the guy that picks up a hammer, right? Uh, I'm the guy that pays the guys who pick up the hammer, which is right. fine. Um, but I love, like, I'm, I'm really thrilled with like the whole process of it. And so I ask so many questions. And so what, when we hire a property management company at that level, they generally have a construction manager type role. There's like the one dude on the team that's been doing multifamily renovations for 30 plus years and knows everybody and everything, right? That's the guy I want to talk to like every day. <laughs> I want to learn from. And so when we walk the properties, 
I'm always asking, you know, how are you sourcing your materials? How are you managing these guys? How do you pick these vendors? What are you looking for when you're doing quality checks? Top to bottom, you know, the more I ask, the more I learn. And so now we're at the point where I've been doing this for, for enough years now that I have a pretty good idea of what our projects will cost, who I need to get involved. You know, before I'll give an example, like there's a few types of electrical panels in, that are very common in our markets and like 25% of the time they catch fire, right? Like, These are bad, bad news and your insurance company is going to want you to rip them out. So all I knew in the, you know, the beginning, I probably actually didn't even know that they were bad. Now I know they're bad. I know how to identify them. I know what it's going to cost to replace. I know who to call to replace those things. Um, and I know the other, you know, potential issues that might, might come with that kind of project. And so just continually asking those questions, you learn over time. I, I, there's still things, you know, every day I'm learning something new. I learned a whole new thing about drainage the other day that, that, that I didn't know about, but, you know, finding the guys who do know that and leaning on them, you know, vetting, getting your, getting recommendations from your management company, from other contractors, you know, you start to find the guys that consistently do quality work and just ask them as many, and, and the good guys will sit down and explain it to you. And those are, those are the best guys that I've worked with that are very happy to explain it, show me what's going on and then give me a fair price. And then I'm happy to pay them to go do that work. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And there's so many variables that go into it that people don't even realize, right? Like, just like you said, you just learned about drainage, Yeah. you know, and, and how important that can be. And, you know, depending on the vintage, like you're saying, there's, you know, the electrical can be so different. The plumbing mm -hmm. can be different. Even the like heating and, you know, the HVAC can be totally different. And so, yeah. you know, understanding all the different aspects. So we were kind of talking offline, you guys love heavy lifts. So mm -hmm or are not afraid of them, I should say. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure anyone really loves them, but maybe you guys do, but I actually do. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. We'll kind of touch on that. You know, what um, are most of your deals like that? Or, you know, how did you realize that you guys are willing to take those on? I would say we have a mix. Uh, our sweet spot is like a C-class value add property. Um, we have bought um, two of the five properties we just bought are B-class type properties and are a bit nicer. Um, but I love a community turnaround and, and a heavy lift for me is not just like the units are rough, but maybe there's a gang on the property and, and there's crime issues and the reputation is terrible. I'll give you a quick story. You know, we bought a 336 unit property in Winston-Salem in October of 2020. So we're about 15, 16 months into ownership now. Um, when we were in due diligence, we called, Hey, let me order a few pizzas out here. You know, I got a big team here pizza shop says, no, we don't deliver to that property. We don't, we don't come out there. And it wasn't because we were outside of the range. It was because we just don't go to that property. <laughs> like that's the first indicator. Like, Oh, we're, <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> she <laughs> can't get a pizza delivered. And I'm standing here, you know, with all these, all these people. Um, but it's a good sort of surrounding area and a growing surrounding area and a property that was grossly, grossly mismanaged. And so we, um, we recognize, like, you can see the minor league baseball stadium from the property. Like it's walking, you can see the, literally see the path of progress coming down the road. Like, okay, we have a good enough area. We're not in the middle of the hood. That's, you know, no matter what I do, you know, there's, there's a neighborhood level where no matter what you do, the property, it's still in that neighborhood. Right. So there's a cap for how nice you can go. But if you can find that really beat up property that is in a good enough area or a rising area, like that is what we really love. And so this property is that. Um, we had two different gangs on the property. I had crime, all kinds of crime happening. So, you know, we did things like pay the police department to patrol at night, 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. I paid 45 bucks an hour for the Winston-Salem PD to pick up extra shifts and patrol my property every night and to park outside of the unit that, you know, had a lot of high traffic that they were selling stuff at all hours of the night, right? You're selling something in the middle of the night, you're, you have a lot of high traffic, I'm going to park a police cruiser out there, I'm going to make it bad for business. You know why? Then you bring your business somewhere else, right? And you leave my property. <laughs> so uh, those kinds of things, just things that you don't really think about, like, oh, I can pay the police department for extra patrols. We actually so you're even, saying that's not legal business is what you were saying. You're saying that's not a sanctioned business happening. I'm just saying property. if it wasn't sanctioned, there was a police cruiser out front and it probably is bad for business if it's not a legal business. That's all I'm saying. High traffic unit in the, in the middle of the night, people coming and going all hours. Let's park a police cruiser there and see what happens, right? That tenant dropped off their keys the next day, right? They just leave, right? They don't come back. Wow. So, uh, 
you know, so you've got like that element of, of crime. So you can clean that up. Um, but then you, then you're left with like an existing tenant base that, you know, is, is starving for like some kind of acknowledgement and love. And so like we start with, let's take care of your work orders. Like th- such a simple concept, but we had hundreds and hundreds of work orders when we took over that property and we started taking care of work orders. And then the number ballooned, like more than doubled. Right. So we're up to like 500 open work orders because residents saw we were actually taking care of things. They're broken, you know, faucet. And then we come into the unit and we say, oh, yeah, well, there's this issue and that issue. But previous previous ownership, they weren't taking care of any of it. So we didn't even bother putting work orders in. So we see our work orders balloon from like 200 up to 500. But then they start coming down because we we hire extra maintenance staff. Right. So in the year one, I know it's going to be rough. I'm budgeting in my underwriting for an extra maintenance tech. That way we spread the workload around between our team. And we know if we can take care of our work orders, our residents are going to be happier. They're going to be much more likely to sign a rent increase, a renewal, and they're going to start to tell their friends, right? So now we've gotten rid of the crime. We've started taking care of the work orders. They see that stuff is getting fixed. We start to put amenities in. Right. We rip out the 40 year old playground that's got rusted nails and pipes and whatever else on it and put in a brand new playground. Right. That makes a huge difference to the perception. A resident comes over. Oh, there's a spot that my family can enjoy. Right. Dog parks. Right. Things that these residents had never even considered having. Right. And so we do that even, I would say, before the property is ready for it. Like we're, we try to add more value first. We give them the amenities and we know the rest of the property is going to kind of catch up, right? Because normally you'd say playground and dog park is C plus type property, not like a D, but let's go ahead. We're doing all these changes. We know that tenant base is going to cycle through. So we pop it in, right? We get great photos, great landscaping, all this stuff. So now, now the property has got amenities. It's got work orders being taken care of. So the residents are happy. And you know the, the crime is, is now at this point, a few months in, almost non-existent or at least back to normal kind of levels. And then we start renovating, right? So we can renovate our units and now we can start asking for higher, higher rates and we can execute the rest of our business plan. And so on that property, previous ownership, I mean, they were really grossly underperforming on the rents and just letting, you know, they had a very low basis, so they didn't care. And that, in that example, 559 is what they're renting two bedrooms for, right? In any market. I don't care what market you're in. That's a yeah, low, that's a low, low. price. <laughs> okay, 559. Uh, we're renting those now, 16 months in, for over $900. Right? Wow. Because we went through this. And, and that's not just like uh, landlords like, hey, raise the rents, you know, $400 almost. No, it's through this systematic, the extra investment in the property, the extra investment in the staff. We've turned this property around. We're actually a finalist for a turnaround property of the year right now. I'm pretty excited about that. Oh, wow. It's coming soon. But all these steps, you know, you move through it and now there's, it's, it's a totally different level. Now where it's a, a year and a half later, well, that the next property down the next street has turned, right? And the next one is turning. And it's like, you see that path of progress getting closer and closer and we're doing resident events and we're doing giveaways and all of a sudden, you know, collections are at an all time high month after month. Expenses are low, like, the, the work orders, I'm hovering between five and eight open work orders a day right now oh, from those sweet. hundreds, right? <laughs> We're on top of it. So all these things contribute to that entire turnaround and it takes time and you have to have investors in a plan that's on board for those first few months that are rough because those first few months, it's like, it's bleak. And you're like, trust me, trust me, we're going, we're going, we're going. And you start to see these signs and all of a sudden it's like a switch gets flipped and you know, you cleaned out the, cr- the crime and you've, you've got, you're starting to attract tenants or residents and the, um, the applications, you know, count starts going up and up and up. And you realize that you've now changed perception of this property. So our last step now, which we're in the middle of, is to change the name. So we've, I think, shed sort of the, the old reputation and the old name. And now I'm ready. I didn't want to change the name on month one because I knew that property in month one is not the property that's going to be in month 16. So right. I knew, wait a year and a half, then get clean, clean it up first. Now we're going to change the name. We're going to have this awesome new, new, new quotes, property, new name, new brand, but on a performing property that residents love to live in and have monthly events where we're giving them out pizza and March madness events. I was just going to say, can you order a pizza there now? Yeah, exactly. I can order pizza there now. 
we're doing a pool party next month to to announce the opening of the. That's of and the then that's pool. that's got to go in the new that the investor newsletter. Hey guys, good news! We can order pizza to the property now. <laughs> wow, that's for incredible success, yeah. transformation! Congratulations, by the way, Thank that's you. awesome. So, uh, the firm I was with last year, we did kind of the same thing in Oklahoma City, and what we noticed is that you're actually even though the tenant base you have in there may have a bad rap and sure, certainly you want to clean some of them out, but by adding those amenities, like you guys did, especially from the start, getting on top of the work orders, actually paying attention to the tenants first, a lot of them actually stayed and were willing to continue along with the rent increase. Were you guys yeah. finding the same thing with, with some of the tenant base there? Um, we're seeing a mix. We certainly have some residents that have been there for a long time. And this is something my manager keeps working on me with is to residents, not tenants. So um, I keep Sorry, catching yes, myself, residents. but it's, uh, it's the, it's the proper phrase. So when you're talking about a community, so the residents there, um, they, I would say more than a third, actually probably about half at this point ha we've turned over. So about half the, the residents have left over 150, um, which fine, right. They either didn't qualify. They didn't want to stick around for the the new sheriff in town as far as you know crime and all that kind of stuff so fine go ahead um and so we actually saw our occupancy levels drop when we closed it was like 97 percent occupied but was full of undesirable tenants right now we have desirable residents and so we dropped all the way down to like 79 in the scooch like 79 and a half which like started to make me kind of nervous but even at 79 percent we had a record noi month record collections at record noi and then we've been building back up from there. And so, so that's all part of it because you have to be willing to take, take that dump and occupancy is a metric we look at for success, but not the only metric. And I'd much rather have 80% full of residents that want to be there, that want to be part of the community that are paying <laughs> versus 97% full with residents that are, you know, causing all kinds of problems at all hours of the night. And that's another aspect that people don't talk a lot about. Like, you know, everyone wants to talk about, like you were saying, occupancy rate. And yeah, sure, 98% occupancy sounds great, but how many of those people are paying? Yeah. You know, because like you said, if you have 80%, but 100% of that 80 is paying, that's yeah, saying something, spot. just like yeah. you're saying, record NOI month. And so that's a huge, huge aspect of it for sure. And of course, you know, you want it to be clean and you want to change out and you want the residents that stay and all that. So mm -hmm. that's awesome that you guys were able to create that community now. And it's a safe place for people to live and people want to live there. So obviously you guys have on-site management. Are you yeah. still having to involve security or any of that or all that's like completely cleaned out? So it's very intermittent. Um, it kind of comes with the season. We actually saw a little bit of an uptick in like some, some tagging, some graffiti on, on our buildings just this month because it, it got kind of warm out overnight now. So there's, I think, more foot traffic happening, but um, we actually called our contact and, and they're doing an extra patrol, but uh, there's no, uh, besides a, a little bit of group, and I think it's just two, two tags on there, um, you know, that we haven't really seen an uptick. So it it's something where we continue to have great relationships with, with the local PD. Um, we have in our model unit, it's stocked full of um, waters and sodas and snacks and so they know they can just pop into the model unit whenever they want or the office come grab a cup of coffee we encourage that because then it's just an extra patrol through the property you know and, and i'm happy to pay pay them a cup of coffee and a snickers bar or whatever they want to uh to do that so it's it's not like you do it and it's done it's an ongoing continual process we've only renovated we've renovated a little over a third of the units it's a three-year renovation plan and so we are still a work in progress. I still have 200 units to renovate. I still have a lot of other projects to do there, um, new signage and more more landscaping and everything. But we've done the triage part. Now we can do the stabilization part, and that's what's next. Awesome. That's that's so great. And obviously, you know, like you alluded to earlier, making sure that your investors are setting. You set that expectation with your investors, like, hey guys, this is this is a heavy lift. It's going to take time. You know, we have to be patient here. And as long as they're on board with that, which typically if they're investing in that deal and you've set that expectation, they're on board with it. Yeah. And then here you are 16 months later and, you know, you're up for award for, you know, turnover property of the year. And that's so huge. So awesome. I, I love this very much. It's been a great story. I've loved hearing yeah. about this because like we mentioned before, it's such an underrated or under 
yeah, underspoken part of the part of the business. Yeah. But we are nearing the end. So I do have five questions that I ask all of my guests. Let's the do final it. five. So the first one is best advice you've gotten from a mentor. Hmm. You know, uh, my partner, Matt, um, who was a mentor to me on that first project, and now we're business partners in all these deals. Um, whenever I'm feeling like a bit overwhelmed, I think like Matt is like one of the most positive people. And this, he always says like, there's a way through it, right? No matter how dark it gets, there is a path through this, right? And we've had some rough months on some of our properties and like, how are we going to get through this? No, there is a way we just have to find it. And let's sit down and think about it. And so the best advice I think is um, no matter how you're feeling, if even if you're feeling like everything is sort of falling down around you there, there will regroup, figure out the way there's a way through it. I love that. That's so true. It's hard sometimes for sure. But you know, they yeah. say the night is dark is just before the dawn. So exactly. awesome. And so what is it about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Man, I like I love these questions. Um, you know, I have a heavy why with my family. And, and I obviously I, I want to spend a lot of time with them. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, I've had some great successes in the last few years, um, just built built this brand new house I'm sitting in and um, able to to put my kids in the schools they want to be in and the neighborhood they want to be in and the area we want to be in like I've had all this great success but it starts with like my contentment first like there I when I was working full-time I was out of out of sync out of balance like I was good at what I was doing um, and it was paying me but I didn't love it right and so I, I kind of think about these three things as sort of all pulling like sort of like a three circle Venn diagram right so when I had my job, great, I'm making good money and, and I'm good at it. I just don't have that sense of fulfillment um, with real estate, you know, with asset management, with what I'm doing with these turnarounds, right? They're like, the reason I'm so excited to share that story about the property I just said is because there's so, so much fulfillment that comes from the, the new residents that are there and uh, the stories I hear and the reviews we see on Google and all these other things. And so my, I'm very much in alignment with like what I'm very good at doing, what's paying me very well, and what I love to do. And so if, if anyone can find like the intersection of those three things, I think you'll be set up for success. Gosh, I love that so much. And that's what I love about pretty much everyone I've talked to in this industry, whether it be on the podcast or just, you know, networking, it, everybody loves it here. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's so awesome. And everybody wants to help everyone. It's, it's so incredible to see. Yeah. Cool. I love that. So what is your favorite non-real estate or investment related book? Um, man, I love, um, I love never split the difference by Chris Voss, the negotiation book. You probably hear that a lot, but I haven't heard that one yet, but I have heard of the book. I okay. actually have, I've listened to I bought it. masterclass just because he's got a session on there after I read that book. And, um, you know, your first inclination is you negotiating. You say, well, yeah, let's split the difference and we'll, we'll both end up kind of happy. But, um, you know, his whole story about being a hostage negotiator and like, there is no difference. There's no splitting the difference if it's a matter of like, I'm going to kill this hostage or not, you know? So um, his perspective and, and the way he put that story together is, is really great. So I get a lot of awesome. That. Love that. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Oh man, this one I was not prepared for. <laughs> superpower. Oh man, this is uh, that's great. I love that question. Um, my, my kids are getting into uh, Spider-Man and Hulk and everything, but I think it'd be cool to be Spider-Man and just sort of fly through the town and shoot your webs. I think it'd be pretty cool. So I love that. Go Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Who wouldn't want that? And superhuman strength? Come on. Absolutely. Awesome. And last questions. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you and uh, learn more? Yeah. I mean, look, if you are interested in asset management, I, I also agree that there's not enough uh, talk out there about it. So I put a podcast together called True Multifamily uh, which I'm the host of, and I interview asset managers. I tell stories from our properties, like the one I just told, um, and, and many others. So uh, True Multifamily on Instagram, Facebook, um, and anywhere you download a podcast, you can find me there. Sweet. We will link all that in the show notes. Thank you. Justin, it's been incredible. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. Listen, I know it's cliche and you hear it all the time, but 
please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you know when the next video is coming out. Even though this is technically a daily podcast, you know it's coming out the next day. Um, we have a ton of content coming your way. So please like and subscribe. It helps a ton. Leave comments. We'd love to know what you guys think. And uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.